So, we have a brief thing. We're going to go through a couple of the things that Scala can do. Um, if you have REPL running, just type what I'm typing and uh, we'll see the results. So, we'll do, it's functional language, right? So here, here's the cool stuff. Object function. So, we're going to try some of these functions. Does anyone try closure, by the way, or any other functional language? Ish. But that's good. You know, we don't want to you know, start with something unusual. So let's let's try a simple, simple thing that just sums all integers. So we'll do a sum of integers from some A to some B. So really, really simple. So what we're gonna do is write a function. So in Scala functions start with a def. So we can say def and then you know give it a name, so sum of ints, I don't know. And then we'll start from A. B, and we'll return an int. So that's just a signature. Uh, if anyone has any questions, just wait, right? So this looks like Pascal, right? So the type is on the right-hand side. So this is a function called sum of ints, taking A and B as an int, returning an int. So what do we do? Um, we're not going to do it, we're not going to have a for loop, we're going to do it properly recursively. So that's going to be the fun bit. So, another cool thing is that everything in Scala is an expression. So every type, you have no statement. So even if has a value. So let's do that. So this sum is simply, if A is greater than B, then I'm done, right? There's no more to be added. Then the result is zero. Else, the result is A plus sum of ints, and I'll do A plus one, <coughs> and B. And that's that. So that works as we expect. And so this is the cool thing. I could write this thing as a value. Not like Java, where you had to remember a variable and say if A is greater than B, then assign a value and then return the thing that you assign. So you can do that and do right, you can try it. Sum of ints from 0 to 10. As we expect, right? So 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. Okay. Everyone happy? Excellent. Right. Let's make it slightly more complicated. Now we're going to be doing sum of squares. So this, we've done the first one, right? So it's just a sum of functions A to B of essentially A. Like that. If I want to do it. So it's scrapped in horribly more. I equal A to Y. So 0 to 50. Let's, let's make it slightly more complicated and do I squared. So, how about you? You can probably type it out. So I'll type, I'm sure you can follow it exactly as I've done. So sum of squares, as an example. From A, an int, to B, which is an int, returning an int. And that is the same thing, right? A, if A is greater than B, then zero. So we're, we're done, nothing more to be added. Else, now this thing, instead of A plus sum of int, I'm going to say A times A plus sum squares of a plus 1 and b. So there's that. So I can do now sum of squares. All right, let's see. That's going to give me slightly greater numbers. So if I do from 0 to 5, or 10, it's slightly bigger number, right, as we expect. Here's a funny thing. Right? This right. is now starting to look a bit suspicious. So if you look at what I've written, this whole lot looks the same. It's almost the same thing, except for that in the first case. So A times A, and just the A here. So let's do one more thing. And this is what I found. This was my cool, right? You can do one more sum, which is which is rather funky. So you sum again from A, but we're going to vary by 4 to some B. And if we compute that, that actually turns out that it converges to pi over 8. Look, you know much more mathematics than I possibly can, so just, you know, it works. Take my word for it. So let's, say, let's see if we can type that out. That's almost the same thing. So def, and we'll call it sum pi from a to b. Again, the same thing. E int, uh, we'll return double this time. Inside that, right? And it is. If A is greater than B, then 
zero, else, and now this, this funky thing, isn't it? So one dot zero divided by a times a plus two times a that plus some i. Now we'll increase a by four and b. Right, so let's see. Some i one to a thousand iterations times eight. That's close enough, right? If we were in America, this is great. You know, three would have been wonderful. Now, all right, look, so here's the funky thing. We now have a pattern that you may have noticed. So now I have a pattern called sum. And then there are things I do. You know, there are things like increasing the index. And then there's a third thing, which is this thing. So what do I do in every step? So it would be quite useful, maybe, to extract this common pattern, pattern of summing up stuff. And so I could write this, right? I could write. Let's try it without the types, and then we'll fill in the syntax. So sum. Sum goes from A to B. And then it needs a thing that I do to every index. How do I increment? How do I get to next A? And then, what do I do? What do I compute in every A? Right? So, watch this. A, B, right? So that's this bit, <coughs> A and B. Below and up about. This thing, ink. So ink that takes some number, this, this index A, and it gives me the next A. A trivial form, you know, plus one. In this case, plus four. And then this thing. So given, given that index, you know, spit out some value. Like that. Right, so here we have the functions in Scala. This is quite funky. So, Completing the syntax and the type signatures, A is again int. So far, so good. Everyone happy? A. B is an, an int. So far, so good. Now this, what does that want to be? That's not just a number. Any ideas? Function. function. Yeah, it's function. So what, what does it take and what does it spit out? Yeah, so it takes an int. That and it returns an int. So the Scala speak to say that is that. I take an int, return an int. And this thing will take an int and return a double. And this whole thing returns a double. Right, and we're just going to rewrite the stuff we've done a few lines ago. So I'll type slowly, you can type more quickly, and we should get at the same result. So that equals, oh, let's see now. If a is greater than b, then 0. Else, what do we do? Um, well, it's going to be a comp y to a, one to the value, plus sum of inc a, so the next a, and b. But we need to pass in those inc function and the comp function to the next call. Right? They stay the same. So inc comp. Ugh. Now what? Error expected but found. Where do I have a thing here? Yeah. Yeah. Like that. So that would be. So now let's see if we can express our previous functions in terms of that. So now I have a clever one called sum, which takes a and b and essentially way to get next a and way to. <coughs> You know, get value for a for some index. So, how about our original sum? You know, just the sum of i's here. Well, it's a sum from, so let's say 0 to 10. So, what are we doing in every step? We are increasing by 1. And what is the computation? Computation is that value that we were given. So x to x. And computing that should give us 55 dot zero to the doubles. So let's improve that ever so slightly to make the most of Scala syntax. Now this is going to be quite funky. First of all, mathematicians in the room, you should leave now, but okay, never mind, stay. 
This thing, what is that? I, what, what would you call it? In human speak, we'd probably call it identity. It's the same thing, right? So we don't have to type that function literal, which is that arrow thing. We can type in, indeed, identity. OK? But we can type identity when you do it properly. Entity, come on. This is grim, isn't it? There we go. Right. So identity is the same thing. OK, so far so good. How about this thing? We could probably improve that. Now, Scala has this thing called automatic lifting of methods to functions. Now, this constant, number one, is an instance of Java Lang or of int. And int has a method called plus. So let's see, right? So I can have plus int. It has so many other things. In, in amongst all that goodness, it has f plus which takes, you know, some that, which is an int, returns an int, by doing that number plus that number. Now that looks, its shape looks exactly like this function. You know, a thing that takes an integer, you know, that parameter, and returns an integer. But we can do just that, right? So we can do this. So we have an instance of one, which is an int. And from that, I want the method plus, which is that, which takes an int and returns an int, which is exactly that. Brilliant. Now, you know, syntax sugar ahoy, right? And I can simplify that as just one plus, if you want to. But then you get a warning, because you really shouldn't be doing that. If you want to get rid of the warning, you have to do what that says. Run the feature and you have to import some sort of. Doesn't matter. Okay, so how about we do this pi thing? One more thing, and then Nigel will show us big data. So this is far more interesting. Big data is great. This is just boring old stuff, right? So how about pi? So we'll do from, I don't know what, 1 to 1000 again. We're doing 4 plus, We're increasing by 4. And then for every x, we are computing 1.0 over x times x plus 2 times x. Now, oh, come on. Uh, times 8. It's pi over 8, right? That's pretty close. Let's do one more zero. Because I have an exercise. As key as I am, right? So, you get up. This is close enough. So this is probably Canada. Sorry. And now we have a problem, right? Stack overflow. Boom. Why is that? So if you look at our definition of sum, what's that? It's, it's a recursive function. Right? So every time we call it, we call that again. And so we allocate more on the stack. Now, is there any way that you can think of to fix it? As a hint, you may have heard about tail recursion. No? Some, some of you are nodding, so I'll leave that as an exercise. There is a way to rewrite this as an iterative process, but still without using form. Right? Forms, they're, they're not that great, because you mutate some. Let's not do that. We can rewrite this iteratively. Well, that's after Nigel's thing. So, Nigel, big data. Let's let's talk about big data. We have some exciting stuff. Well, I hope so. Yeah. And how are we doing? How are we doing that? If everybody's happy and familiar with the using the closures functions in line, those types of things. Everybody's familiar with Java. Yeah. So we're doing that sort of stuff. So what I thought might be um, a little bit instructive for you, especially with respect to um, Java is to have a look at the collections library inside Scala, which is a work of utter wonderfulness as far as I'm at least concerned. If one's stuck in Java land for a very long time, then you can do some really interesting things with the Scala collections library. And there would be a three-day course if we could. But we've got 
five minutes. Okay? So I'll just show you a couple of things that we think are quite easy to get a handle on, but also extremely powerful. So I'm going to make a value, and that value is going to be a list. Um, for construction, you can use companion objects, which is why I don't need to use the keyword new anymore. So there's an implied new sitting in the front of that list. So if we have a look at that, we'll see that the compiler in the red ball has basically said, okay, Nigel's constructed a list of things, and there it is. Okay, so that's a that's a place to start. So where do we get all this power from if we think this is an incredibly powerful thing? Well, the idea is that we can put closures into our collections, okay, which you can't yet do with Java. They are promising. Are we, are we there yet? Or? Spring, come on. Spring. Oh, oh okay. so you can do this. So anyway, here we go. So we can say, for example, that within this, um, we want to go over every item, and we want to take x, and I'm going to use the same form as Jan. There are shorter forms for doing this, but I find this one is probably the most easy one to get into your head as quickly as possible. Uh, what we want to do is we want to square everything um, in that list. Okay, so this is very, very similar to um, Yang's example. I'm going to pass a function into the collection, and we're going to multiply the items by that. So that's the I love it when the first one works. But we have uh, map, which is one of the essential um, collection functions. If you've seen functional collections anywhere else, you'll know about map, a flat map. And also filter, so we can do filtering on that list. Let's have a go with the filter. Uh, and we now use a predicate rather than um, a function, that is we have to return some boolean. Okay? So I want to move out all the things that are less than 3, for example. So where x is less than 3, I want to filter on that. So there, I get all the numbers in that list that are less than 3. Okay? So that's the basic idea. So we can begin to pass functions into our collections rather than operating on the collections in each way. Um, and we also have some other things that are kind of like uh, built on, on, on the canon of those fundamental um, map, flat map and filter um, functions. And we even have syntactic sugar, if you want to get into it. There's a huge amount of syntactic sugar that, ma that manipulate, these, manipulate these things. So everybody loves um, big data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of the same tricks that Jan just showed you. And I'm going to reassign L to be one, two, not too many. Oh, so is, that, is that big enough data for our big data? Yeah, we'll call that big data. Okay. So what's going on there is that we know that in Scala, all of our numbers are objects and they have methods because they have things like plus, so that we can do when in the end of the plus thing inside the int class. But it's also got, got, got uh, a function method two. Okay. So what I can do is I can use this two, which takes the parameter of the other end of the range, and this thing returns a range. Okay, and ranges are quite interesting because they're not completely evaluated at the time when you make them. Um, it will have only worked out the numbers that is printed out there in that range. Okay, so it's not it's not quite lazy, but it is actually something where you get these things when you start to use them. So you'll see that in my range there, I, I've got enough to work out exactly what I'm doing. So what I can do with that range is I can, for example, partition it. So let's do uh, partition. Okay. And my partition function is going to be x say less than, let's have some zeros on there. I'll do the trick. And Let's see what we get for that. So basically what we get is we get two vectors. And the first vector is full up of the numbers that are less than 4,000. And the other vector is full up of the numbers that are greater than 4,000. Okay? So, um, what about we... Uh, I'm just going to import... In Scala we import things to get them into the namespace. So I can do Scala. Dot, dot, dot. And then I'm going to do an alias here as well. So, uh, random. Okay. 
is alias to rd. Okay, so all that's saying is get into the namespace something that's an rd, and that's going to refer to this thing round. So let's, I've pulled that in now into the current namespace. Then what I can do is I can say to this thing, okay, I want to make an array, please, and in this array, I want to fill it okay, for that many instances with random numbers. And that's why I'm just going to use rd here. So we can see this on the line, so I can say next. Between <coughs> zero and one. Okay, so you can see now that we've managed to construct an array relatively tersely with numbers ranging between zero and one hundred. Okay. And we're going to represent, say that's representative of, of, of people's ages, for example. So then the question is, yeah, it's changed my slides. He's really I wrote old or aged, and he wrote decrepit. So, as long as you hide, you well, I know, I know. So, what we're going to do is we're going to make up the rule that everybody who's older than forty-nine, okay, is old. Okay. I think that's a I think that's a very good age good. to split it on. Okay. So, let's have a go and see if we can't split this up. So, we're going to do. Um, we're going to make another vowel, but this is another one. If you're used to using Java, for example, which is quite interesting because. There's the aged people, and then there are the young people. And this is an example of using a pair, which is a tuple. Okay, so I'm going to return two values in a tuple so coming back from this. Normally, you either have to return uh, a single object or a single instance. Um, but we're going to pack these two things together, which is what um, the partition does for us. So let's take R and partition it according to. Uh, my rule for being old, which is that you have to be greater than 49. Let's see. Okay, so there's, there's, your, uh, there's your first array. So I can do, for example, uh, aged. So we go. <coughs> yes. Let's find all the people who. I'm going to start typing decrepit now. Uh, so, the aged people are aged. The identity. So, there we go. That's all the people grouped in that particular array. Okay. And we can also do, um, almost the same, the same, we can put the identity function in there as well. Okay. okay. Or we could try, try and count those up. So let's do aged. And do a map of the keys and values coming out of that. So I'll do K, B. So this is using case, this is using pattern matching to take this apart now. Okay, so I've got the key and the size of that particular one will be the number of people of that age. Yeah. So we're going to count all these people who are 69 in the first instance here. We're going to count all those up. Okay. Ooh. Try doing that in another way. Try going around a different way for that. Let's do aged. Map the values for so ignoring the keys. Uh, maybe 
just is not the correct, the correct type there. I'll try to do this. Ages. Is it ages? Is it ages? No. Yeah. So ages are all the numbers. And eight is what do we have? We did the pattern match. Let me go back. You have some ages in the first map with case if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this one needs ages rather than age. Is it? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that goes to one. Yeah, that's much better. That's much better. Apologies for that. So let's try this other one, which is the map values. Just to see if we can get that one too. Run as well, just so we can remove the key from that. <coughs> Again, this is a very, very quick sort of grand tour. So these things, let's do the Yep, so that's nice. There we go. We've got to count four of those. Um, so that just gives you some idea of the type of data manipulation that you can do across data sets. Um, I wanted to leave you with one that's a bit of a mind boggler, which comes from uh, a talk which is called uh, Scala Wizardry or something in the land of collections, something like that. So I'll, I'll give you this one, which is, if you can find that talk, it's a fabulous, fabulous talk, and it just gives you some more handles into some of the um, rather fantastic things you can do.